Hi guys, Rob Kelly here. Hope you are all well. Just wanted to talk for a little bit about uh, emetophobia, strangely enough, and particularly about people, sufferers, getting their head around the predictability of overcoming it. I know that uh, many of you have suffered for, for a long, long time with um, the significantly debilitating symptoms of emetophobia. But actually how long you've had it is irrelevant. How long you've suffered from emetophobia is completely irrelevant. It has no effect at all on how hard it is for you to overcome it. So whether you've had it for six months or whether you've had it for six years or whether like Mary uh, um, you'd had it for 75 years, it makes no difference at all. Very common uh, for people to say, uh, when, they, when I first meet them or when they first get in contact, oh, Rob, I've had it for so long, it's gonna be so difficult. I've suffered for such a long time. It's so ingrained, it's so fixed in my mind. I've had it for so long now, it's part of my life. It's this, it's that, the other. It's actually completely irrelevant how long you've had it. It's no harder or easier to overcome it if you've had it two weeks or 80 years. And you want to understand why that's the case, because your belief about the fact that the longer you've had it, the harder it is to overcome it, is a, is a hugely unhelpful thing for you to have and makes your recovery from it and your ability to then go on to thrive very difficult indeed. So let me talk about a couple of things. First of all, let's look at Mary. Mary, she's 80 five or something now and as you know Mary overcame her emetophobia. She did it about six or seven weeks but that's about from when she had the start of the book. So I think she probably, let's say she only really put effort in after week three as most people do, that means she actually overcame her emetophobia 75 years worth of emetophobia in three or four weeks. Um, Lisa on the other hand and thank you for the recent feedback on Lisa's uh, recent video, the talk we did in here. Lisa overcame her emetophobia in three days. So from very, very severe emetophobia, um, you know, like most, affecting every single day of her life, to not affecting her at all in about three and a half days. Days. And the reason she was able to overcome it in three and a half days is because she went from having thousands of unhelpful, powerless catastrophic, um, scary thoughts a day to next to none in a couple of days. Thousands and thousands of catastrophic, powerless, scary, anxiety-provoking thoughts every single day, and then she just stopped. And the moment she stopped, she decreated her emetophobia. And I want to explain to you why that's possible. So a good comparison would be something like the Flat Earth Society. As you know, because it's in the books, there exists this thing called the Flat Earth Society, where literally millions of people absolutely believe that the Earth is flat. Now, there's lots and lots of evidence on a daily basis. You come across lots and lots of evidence on a daily basis that clearly demonstrates the Earth is round or spherical, okay? You know, the fact that no matter how high up you are, you can only see for about 20 miles. The fact that you can see the other planets revolving around us. The fact that you uh, experience gravity, which is the round planet spinning. The fact that you see on all the news articles, pictures from space and blah, 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 blah. So. There's lots of evidence every day strongly suggesting that the Earth is round, okay? So in order for you to maintain your belief that in fact the Earth is flat, if you want to maintain your belief that the Earth is flat, despite all this evidence you see every day that it's round, you're gonna to have to work really hard on that. You're gonna to have to work really hard to maintain your belief that the Earth is flat, 
whilst everyone else around you says it's round and all the evidence and the pictures that you see every day of your life suggests it's round. And of course, a very quick Google search will provide a million pictures and photos of the Earth being round and measurements and all this kind of stuff. So if someone wants to maintain their belief that the Earth is flat, despite all this overwhelming evidence to the contrary, they're going to have to work really bloody hard to do that. And that means every day they've got to keep telling themselves the Earth is flat. Ignore these people. Ignore what they're saying. They're, 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 they're conspiracy people. They're trying to fool us. Like They're trying to fool us that a man landed on the moon. They're trying to fool us that JFK got shot. They're trying to fool us about this, about that. The Earth is not round. It's completely flat. And I'm, I'm, I'm sticking to my guns. It's flat. It's flat. It's flat. You'd have to do that every day. You'd have to have hundreds of thoughts or very strong beliefs every day in order to maintain the belief that the earth is flat despite everyone else saying it's round. Okay, that makes sense. The moment you stop trying to convince yourself that the earth is flat and you think, oh, what the hell, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to argue with these people anymore. They believe it's round, I believe it's flat, what the hell. The moment you stop doing that and stop adding to your belief, you'll very quickly come to the conclusion that the earth is in fact round. Okay, Because the overwhelming evidence, um, imagine if you tried to convince yourself that gravity didn't exist, you'd very, very quickly come back to the ground with a, with a, with a bump, which would uh, hopefully persuade you that it is in fact real. So, someone that believed that the earth was flat in order to maintain that, that belief, they would have to work very, very hard to keep that belief going because all these pressures on them and around them is trying to get them to understand and realise that it's in fact round. Well, a metaphobia is exactly the same. Metaphobia is exactly the same. The vast majority of people on the planet, of the eight odd billion people, whatever it is, the vast majority of those people don't think that vomiting is terrifying don't particularly think it's disgusting, don't particularly think it's horrible or horrifying or scary in any way, shape or form. The vast majority aren't scared of it, don't worry about it, aren't frightened of it and don't think of it in a hugely negative way at all. I would imagine that the vast majority of people would probably put it on par with having diarrhoea or being constipated or maybe having a migraine, something like that. Something that's a little bit uncomfortable, something that's a little bit annoying a little bit of a pain in the backside for a short while, but nothing terrible and you're going to get over it and move on with your life. So how is it then that you guys, despite all that evidence to the contrary, every day your partners, your friends, they'll say to you, I don't know why you worry about it. I, I, I can puke whenever I want to. You know, I, I puke every day. I blah, 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 blah. You know, Despite all that evidence to the contrary and all the evidence and research in the book, you guys are still maintaining your belief that it's terrible, it's the worst thing in the world, and I'd rather die and it's awful and blah, blah, blah. Okay, a bit like the flat earther. Well, for you to maintain that belief, despite all the evidence to the contrary, and when I say all the evidence, things like about 96% of emetophobes, somewhere about 96% are female. Now, if being sick was genuinely frightening or genuinely threatening or genuinely horrible or disgusting in some way, shape or form, just as many men would have a fear of it as women. And they don't. The vast majority of sufferers are female. Some of the research says about 90%. My experience is it's higher than that, probably around 94. 94 and 95% of sufferers are female. Are, are female. Very, very small percentage of sufferers are male. That doesn't make any sense. If it's terrifying, the same number of men as women um, should have a fear of it. The same number of men as women have a fear of spiders and of dying and of cancer and of airplanes and of claustrophobic spaces and snakes, but not a metaphobia, 95% female, 5% male. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with being sick or vomiting and everything to do with perfectionism, obsessing, having a strong desire for control, um, high social anxiety, low self-esteem, um, high disgust propensity, that really particularly feminine trait, 
of disgust propensity. Also, when you look at the other evidence, <clears throat> that if being sick was genuinely frightening, then people experiencing it would be more likely to develop the phobia, right? And yet, um, people that go through chemotherapy for cancer and are regularly sick are less likely to develop emetophobia. Ladies that are pregnant and go through morning sickness are less likely to develop emetophobia. People that have a sickness bug are less likely to develop emetophobia. In fact, you're more likely to get over emetophobia if you have one of these things than you are to create it. Emetophobia has got nothing whatsoever to do with being sick or vomiting. Nothing whatsoever. So, how do you maintain this belief despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary? How do you maintain this belief that this is the worst thing in the world and you'd rather die when your partner, your husband, your friends, your doctor, your psychologist all say, it's nonsense, why are you frightened about this thing? You must be, like the flat earthers, you must be on a daily basis creating uh, um, catastrophic, powerless thoughts on a almost minute by minute basis in order to keep this phobia so big and so powerful despite all the overwhelming evidence that tells you it's nonsense, why are you worrying? You have to be doing something on a daily basis. You have to keep telling yourself, but it's scary, it's frightening, it's the worst thing in the world, I would rather die, it's disgusting, it's awful, you know, I'd rather kill myself than do this thing. You have to be thinking those thoughts hundreds if not thousands of times a day in order to maintain your belief in the face of the overwhelming evidence that that's not true. Okay? You also do that via your safety-seeking and avoidance behaviours. Every time you wash your hands, you're washing your hands thinking, oh my God, I might get a bug, and if I got a bug, I might be sick, and that'd be the worst thing in the world. Uh, you might be uh, um, checking the doors lock, checking the sell-by dates, checking everything in the fridge, and making your children wash their hands repeatedly, changing your clothes in case you got contaminated by something. So you have to be, in the face of the overwhelming evidence that being sick isn't terrifying at all, doing something every day to keep this thing alive. It's like having a bonfire in your garden and just letting it die out. If you just let it die out, that fire will go out. It might take a couple of days, but it will go out. Eventually it will go out and it will burn itself out completely. Okay. So if that fire is still going a week later... You must be adding to it. You must be putting fuel on it or wood on it. Or you must be poking that fire continuously to keep it big. Well, that's exactly what you do. That's exactly what you do. Every day, you are having thoughts. You are creating thoughts, catastrophic, powerless, scary thoughts about this thing. And you are keeping it alive. You are keeping this thing alive and scary, despite the overwhelming evidence that it's not any of those things at all. Okay? And this is why you can overcome it very quickly when you challenge all of those experiences. Because the moment you stop doing that, your phobia will disappear. The moment you stop having those catastrophic powerless thoughts about emetophobia and being sick, your phobia will disappear almost overnight, just like Lisa's did. You are keeping it alive. You are the one creating it. So if you're... 75 years old, like Mary was when she came to see us. Sorry, 80-something years old, like Mary was when she came to see us. She's had it since she was seven, so she was 82. If you'd had emetophobia for 75 years and, uh, and you were consulting uh, Thrive Programme, age 82, your emetophobia has nothing whatsoever to do with the previous 75 years or the past five years or the past two years or the past one year or the last six months or month, or even week. The emetophobia you are experiencing today, you have created in the last three or four days. Your emetophobia is three or four days old. That is all. I'm going to say that again. Your emetophobia is three or four days old. It has got nothing to do with last week or last month or last year 
or that time when you choked when you were seven, or that time when the kid at school was sick on you, or the time that you choked on that penny, or the time that you were sick, or the time that norovirus bug was going around, or whatever. It's got absolutely fuck all to do with any of those things whatsoever, and everything to do with the catastrophic, powerless thoughts that you are having every single day. You are creating this phobia and maintaining it every single day in just the same way as putting air into a balloon and keeping that balloon inflated and just the same way as keeping a, a fire or a barbecue in the garden going by continually poking it and stoking it and adding more fuel to it. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with your past at all. And this is demonstrated uh, uh, firstly by the fact that most people, when they come to the Thrive or come to overcome their metaphobia, when they do it thoroughly and they throw themselves into it completely, generally speaking, they overcome it in, in six weeks. Okay? And when I say they overcome it in six weeks, it takes the first three or four weeks to learn all about the programme. So actually, they overcome it in two or three weeks. And I think what, uh, uh, what some people have, uh, uh, um, the struggles that some people have overcoming it is whilst you maintain the belief that it's terrifying, it's going to be very difficult to overcome. This isn't something that happens to you. If it was something that happened to you, we would all have it. The vast majority of people on the planet would be terrified if you pointed a gun at them. Only a few of you are terrified with vomit. A very, very, very small population. Okay? Everyone's terrified of guns. Very few people, you know, I think it's 2 or 3% in the main population, 2 or 3%, and most of those, 95% are female, are terrified of being sick. It's got nothing to do with the reality of vomiting at all, nothing to do with the reality of being sick, and everything to do with the catastrophic, powerless thoughts you are having on a daily basis basis that's all catastrophic thoughts now this is incredibly important because the one of the biggest hurdles you have because you feel so powerless about this thing i don't feel powerless about it because of sick it's got nothing to do with being sick um you feel powerless about it because you're having these terrifying thoughts every day about it and you're making this thing big we could create a phobia today here we go Let's do an experiment. Let's create a phobia in somebody of pink USB devices. Don't ask me why I've got it. Pink USB devices, okay? We pick someone in our audience today who's watching this to think about lots of horrible thoughts and terrible ways that they could die by doing something with this particularly bright pink USB device, okay? And then think about it in a catastrophic way. Think about it in a terrifying way. Think about it in a really emotional way. Just two or three hundred times and you'd have a phobia of it. You would have a phobia of this pink USB device. Okay. Now, the vast majority of people would, would, would accept the fact that there's nothing scary about this at all. Okay. And this pink device has done nothing to you to create this phobia at all. You've done that. You've thought about this thing in a terrifying, catastrophic way, and you have created a phobia of it by doing so. The moment you stop doing that, it will disappear. It's only as big as the anxiety that you are creating about it today. Anxiety doesn't last very long. If you have a scary thought, if you watch a horror film, if you watch a horror film and it's really terrifying, how long does it take you to get over it? If you turn the TV off and you go and make a cup of tea and you go and do something else and go to work or something else or take the dog for a walk, how soon are you over? Half an hour? Maybe? Ten minutes? It only takes you two years to get over the death of a loved one. Why would it take you 50 years to get over a fear of being sick? It's nonsense. It makes no sense at all. So anxiety peaks. You have a thought. You create anxiety because of that thought. The emotions respond to the thought. You have a scary thought, you go, oh, cracky. You create all this emotion, and within a few minutes, that emotion will die down again. But then you guys, of course, have another thought, and you create those emotions. Then you have another thought, and you have another thought, another thought. So you are keeping this anxiety level artificially high by all day long having these powerless, catastrophic thoughts. 
if you just stopped having them for half an hour, you'd go, oh God, that feels so much better. Wouldn't take very long at all. I joked with a client a couple of weeks ago and I said, I'd like to do an experiment where we induce an emetophobe into a coma for a month. I'm absolutely positive that if you induced an emetophobe into a coma for a month, then when you brought them out of it, they wouldn't have emetophobia anymore because they wouldn't have spent four weeks poking that fire, blowing air into that balloon, you know, keeping this thing alive. So you, you absolutely got to get this. Okay, You've absolutely got to get this and got to understand this. Okay, You are doing this to yourself and you're doing it to yourself on a daily, hourly, minute by minute basis. The first thought you have when you wake up in the morning is to do with vomiting. The last thought you have at night before you go to bed is to do with vomiting. And then you have tens of thousands of thoughts during the day. Remember that we have something like uh, 50,000 thoughts a day. And the average emetophobe would say that somewhere to 50 to 80% of their thoughts either directly or indirectly on a daily basis are related to their fear of being sick. That means somewhere between 25 and 40,000 catastrophic powerless thoughts a day. Well, you can create a phobia of pink USB sticks by having 100 thoughts about it, or maybe even just five thoughts about it. You know, some people have got a phobia of dogs out of one single experience. So imagine how big a phobia you could create if you're having 25 powerless thoughts every single day. Um, you are doing it to yourself by having these thoughts, okay? And if you watch some of the most recent videos, and I'll put one up in response to this, your thoughts just don't come from nowhere. Your thoughts don't exist in the ether around your head just waiting to pop in there randomly, although it might feel like it. Your thoughts are driven by your beliefs. That's not true, Christine. That's nonsense. Sorry, I'm just replying to a post. Christine says, I can't seem to stop the anxious thoughts the minute I wake up there. That's not true. None of these things come into your head randomly. None of these things come into your head at the blue or are driven into your mind because of vomiting. They're in your mind because you spend all fucking day thinking about it. Well, if you go to bed tonight terrified... Uh, uh, terrified about your pink USB device, what do you think you're going to be dreaming about tonight when you go to bed? What do you think is going to be on your mind tomorrow morning, the moment you wake up? It's going to be a pink USB device, isn't it? Okay. And the only reason that's on your mind is because you went to bed terrified about it. And the only reason you dream about it is because you went to bed terrified about it. And the only reason you wake up in the morning thinking about it is because you go to bed terrified about it. And the only reason you think about it all day is because you have this belief it's terrifying. So you have to overcome the belief that it's not terrifying. And to do that, just look at the evidence. Nobody else agrees with you. Nobody else agrees with you. You're worse than a flat earther. Okay, there is no evidence at all to back up what you're saying. You might as well say that cling clangers live on Mars and are and assassinated President Kennedy. It's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. And the moment you stop catastrophizing to two minutes and take some control over your emotions and your thinking, you would realize that very, very quickly. So yes, you've got to create a more internal sense of power and control. Yes, you've got to build your self-esteem up and know that self-esteem isn't something that happens to you. Yes, you've got to put some uh, effort in and overcome social anxiety. The reason why mostly women suffer from metaphobia and not men is the same reason why girls do much better at school. There's far more pressure on young girls to perform in a certain way socially and to behave in a certain way and to, to feel a certain way than there is on boys. It's very, very simple, very understandable, very predictable why you have a metaphobia and I don't. It's very, very simple to understand and the amount of emetophobia you have is directly related and directly attributable to the number of catastrophic powerless thoughts you have every single day. So if we put you into a coma, excuse me for a sec. So if we put you to in, into a coma for a month and then brought you out of it, 
You haven't been poking that fire for a month. You haven't been blowing air into that balloon for a month. You haven't been keeping this thing alive for a month. It will have just gone out. So you're starting from a completely neutral position again when you come out of your coma. You almost certainly won't have a belief about it again. Yes, if you started then for some reason to think about it in a, in a catastrophic way again, you would very quickly redevelop your phobia. But at that moment, you don't have a phobia. Because to have that phobia, you have to maintain a belief. Your thoughts are driven by a belief or a set of beliefs that you have. They don't come into your mind randomly. You have, if you have a belief that flying is scary and you're going on a flight today, that belief will start driving scary thoughts into your mind. If you have social anxiety, which is a belief, and you're going to party tonight, you might be already worrying about who's going to be at the party and what you've got to wear and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's the belief that drive the thoughts. But then, of course, the thoughts create beliefs. So if you woke up today from your coma and you had no beliefs at all about vomiting in any way, shape or form, but you still started to have hundreds of catastrophic thoughts a day, very quickly you'd recreate a belief, which would then drive the thoughts, and you have this um, self-fulfilling prophecy, you have this cycle. It's irrelevant, Jodie, whether you're surrounded by illness. It's got nothing to do with illness. Uh, emetophobia's got nothing to do with being sick. So it wouldn't matter if you were in a room with a thousand people vomiting. You know, there are just as many Irish people as English people with a fear of snakes, and there's no snakes in Ireland. A phobia has nothing to do with the thing that you think it's about. The thing that you think it's about is irrelevant. There are 12 million people in the UK with a fear of flying. None of them have ever been in a plane crash. Their fear of flying has nothing whatsoever to do with their experiences of being in an aeroplane. Nothing whatsoever to do with it. Okay? It's just about the catastrophic thoughts you have on a daily basis. Now, the amount of effort somebody puts in to overcoming emetophobia, the amount of effort they put in to overcoming it is directly related to how powerful they believe in their ability to overcome it, which is directly related to how much they understand it. So the more you understand the program, the more you understand the program, the more you take on board what I'm saying to you now and think about this all day long, the more predictable you'll understand the program is. Simple as that journey from Cambridge to London. There's a video on that on our YouTube channel. Have a look for that. Okay, it's very, very predictable. At a conference a couple of years ago, an emetophobia conference, I said to the emetophobes there, and I stand by it, if anybody uh, believes they've done the emetophobia program properly and thoroughly, and they are not over their emetophobia, and they can come to me and they can prove to me that they've done the program correctly and thoroughly, I will give anyone £10,000. £10,000 I'll give you if you do this programme properly and you don't overcome your metaphobia. That's how predictable it is. That's how simple it is. It's not easy, but it is simple. It's a simple thing. Follow a number of steps, do them thoroughly, do them with vigour, and you will overcome that phobia. Not only overcome the phobia, but also go on to learn how to thrive. Okay. What happens, though... It's because, generally speaking, you feel so powerless about your metaphobia, you don't put in anywhere near the amount of effort that you think you do. People, uh, I get emails, obviously, from all over the world. And people say, oh, Rob, I'm, I'm trying really hard. You know, I'm, 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 you know I'm, I'm doing it absolutely thoroughly. I'm spending hours and hours every day doing the programme. When you actually question them how much they're doing, I'd be surprised if they're doing 20 minutes a day. And they might be doing, they might be putting lots of effort and they might be putting in an hour a day on one small area, like one of the questions that came up on the feed just now said, well, I'm doing my positives all day long. Well, that's great, but that's not going to change anything. Doing your positives every day changes one small thing, one small part of what you need to be changing. You can't just focus on one small part of it and hope that that's going to do it. It's not going to do it. Doing your positives every day is going to 
help raise your self-esteem, help make your self-esteem more internal, and help to create a more internal locus of control. But you could do your positives a thousand times a day. And if you're having 20,000 catastrophic thoughts about vomiting being the worst thing in the world, they're just going to smother that and you're not even going to notice them. They're going to have no effect at all. You have to do the programme thoroughly, every part of it, every day. You've got to set your stall out and say, right, for the next four or five weeks, I'm going to throw everything I've got into overcoming this phobia. I'm going to bite my tongue, I'm going to dive into it head first, I'm going to do everything I possibly can. When I wake up in the morning, I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, sit around, I'm not going to brood about it, I'm not going to wallow in the pity that I feel for myself suffering this thing, I'm going to do everything about it. And I'll give you a small metaphor for that, why that works. The vast majority of people that stop smoking by willpower find it difficult, find it hard. And yet, women that get pregnant and stop smoking when they're pregnant, generally speaking, about 90% of them find it incredibly easy. In fact, they stop smoking just like that. They don't report any side effects, any withdrawal symptoms. They don't miss it. They don't think about it. They don't worry about it. It's as if they never smoked. It's as if they never smoked. And yet, you could put them next to someone who's trying really, really hard to stop. They've been smoking for 20 years and find it really, really hard to stop and... They tried this and they tried that and the other, and you put, and you put, uh, compare one to the other. I think, well, how come that the pregnant lady found it so easy when that person struggling so hard? Why is that? Well, I'll tell you why that's so so different, so different between the two people. If you try to stop smoking, if you if you determine that you're going to really put in loads of effort to stop smoking, if you're going to say that I'm really going to give it my best shot, I'm going to try my hardest. You're almost certainly going to fail because you're already accepting defeat. You're already saying that this thing's going to be incredibly difficult and I don't know whether I'll be able to do it or not. And, you know, I'm up against this huge mountain. I'm going to try and climb this Everest that's in front of me. I'm going to try and beat this thing, but, you know, I don't know whether I can. Pregnant women don't do that when they stop smoking. Pregnant women say, I don't smoke anymore. That's it. There is no agony of choice for them. They don't say, oh, well, I don't want to hurt my baby. I'm going to try really hard to stop. I'm going to give it my best shot. I'm going to do whatever I can. Like the frown on my face. Now I think it's going to be difficult, but I really try. I don't want to hurt my baby. They say, I don't smoke anymore. There's an absolute confidence in their attitude towards it. They're not, they don't say to themselves that I want to do this thing or I'm going to try and make this thing happen. They say, this thing's already happened. I already don't smoke. The moment I look at this little thing that says that I'm pregnant, I already don't smoke anymore. I just don't do it anymore. Simple as that. There's no pain. There's no withdrawal symptoms. There's no uh, yearnings for a cigarette. There's no sneaking off. There's no headaches. There's no withdrawal symptoms. Nothing at all. Because of their attitude towards it, I've beaten this thing. This thing, this is going to happen. I don't care what hurdles you throw at me. I don't care if I'm tearing my hair out for the next six weeks fighting this addiction to nicotine. I'm not going to smoke. So fuck it, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to harm my baby. I'm just not going to do it. So their attitude towards it and their sense of determination towards this thing makes it very easy for them to stop. They don't feel like they're standing at the steps of Everest thinking, oh my God, how am I possibly going to conquer this thing? They feel like they're standing just in front of a very small hill that seems, I can easily do that. I can easily walk over this thing. There's no way I'm going to smoke. So it doesn't matter how big the hill is, I'm going to beat it. And that's the attitude you have to foster to overcoming emetophobia. If you don't, and you go into it feeling completely powerless, then you haven't understood the bug. And I suggest you go back and read it again. But if you go into it feeling powerless, you're not going to put in anywhere near the amount of effort that you need to put in to make it feel easy. Mary found it easy to overcome emetophobia, as did many of the people in the video testimonials. The reason they found it easy is not because they'd had a different understanding from the programme or the book than you did, but because their attitude was different. Their attitude was... I'm just going to beat this thing. I'm going to throw everything I've got at it. Whether it's for a day, a week or the next 10 years, I'm overcoming this thing. I'm taking control of my life. Fuck it. 
that's going to happen. And because of their attitude towards it, they're going to overcome it relatively quickly. To reiterate the main point of this particular uh, live video is that your phobia is never more than three or four days old. Three or four days old. Your metaphobia is directly related to the number of powerless catastrophic thoughts you have on a daily basis. If you stop them, your metaphobia will stop. It's as simple as that. That's why people like Lisa were able to overcome it in just three days. She went from having thousands of catastrophic powerless thoughts a day to within three days having none. So she woke up on the fourth day and just felt fine. Because she didn't go to bed that night dreading what might happen the next day. She didn't go to bed that night dreading that she didn't check the sell-by date of the milk or dreading that there might be a bug going around the local school or dreading that someone at work might have a bug. It's, got fucking, it's nothing to do with being sick. Your phobia has nothing whatsoever to do with being sick or vomiting. If being sick or vomiting was scary, we would all have it and we don't. Hope this is helpful. See you again soon. Yeah, I know. Who'd have thought it? Twice in one day. So, one other small thing, and this is quite a difficult subject, <clears throat> and I risk of getting shot at for this, because it could be perceived as being of such a tiny bit sexist. And it is more than an observation. There was definitely some research backing this up. But what I find particularly interesting after being a therapist for a long time is that in my experience, women tend to believe their emotions far more than men do. Now, what I mean by that is, if I was to suddenly feel angry now, I wouldn't just immediately try and validate that anger and go and kick the dog. I would ask myself, why are you feeling angry, Rob? And more importantly, is the amount of anger you're experiencing appropriate to the situation? So the dog does a very small, easy to clean up whittle on the carpet and I get really angry. I would question myself to the amount of anger that I'm experiencing. Why am I so enraged? Well, the dog did was have a wee. You know, I can't go and kick the dog just because I did a piddle on the carpet. I've got to challenge the amount of emotion. I've generated all this emotion. I just want to look at all that. Why have I created all that? Just about a simple thing. And metaphobes particularly just go straight in and believe their emotions. You just believe them as if they're a valid scientific measurement of something. Yeah? You see someone at work and, and they've got a bug and you create all this emotion and you just believe it. You didn't question it. You just go, crikey, it must be terrifying because I'm terrified. I, I feel all this emotion, therefore it must be true. And I think it's, I think it's a, a big problem, particularly within something like a metaphobia and actually within personality disorders like BPD and, and uh, narcissism, narcissism, is that in my experience, women far more than men just believe their emotions. You know, I, I, I suddenly feel angry or I suddenly feel sad. I just go straight into it. I believe it. I believe the amount of sadness. It's taken me 25 years to get over the death of a tadpole I had when I was 15 years old. And I still feel sad every day. And I just, oh, I just feel really, really sad. And at no point during that 25 years do I go, Rob, do you know what? Is it appropriate you're feeling this amount of sadness over a tadpole? Is it appropriate you're feeling this amount of anger over a little bit of dogweed? Is it appropriate you're feeling this amount of fear over the fact that someone's got a vomiting bug when I know that the vast majority of the population don't have a fear of vomiting and I know that the most of the people that do are female and that they only have it because they have certain, certain thinking styles and beliefs that nothing whatsoever to do with vomiting. If you guys started to do that more, challenge 
the amount of emotion you're generating about things, instead of just accepting it blindly, oh, I feel terrified, right? Therefore, it must be terrifying. I'm feeling terrified, right, at this mini iPod. Therefore, oh my God, mini iPods must be terrifying. Instead of going, hang on a sec, should I really be feeling that terrified about that? Is there good reason for me to feel terrified about that? Maybe not. Maybe I could be a little bit anxious about it. Okay, so I'm just going to reduce the amount of fear. Thank you, Beck. The amount of fear I'm creating about it. If you automatically just believe the emotions that you're randomly generating throughout the day, life is not going to be very, very smooth for you. You know, emotions don't happen to you. Emotions are the way in which you are responding to situations in life. They are completely changeable. They are completely manageable. You just need to believe that you can do it and put in some effort just to manage it a bit more. Just tolerate. Don't just go straight with it. Oh, my God, it's terrifying. Okay. Just because I'm terrified of this cup doesn't mean the cup is terrifying doesn't automatically work both ways. I'm terrified of the cup, therefore that cup is terrifying. No, maybe I've hysterically overreacted to the cup and just creating all this emotion out of nothing. By the way, the person coughing and sneezing all the time is Ben, Ben who overcame his depression the other year in the next room. Ben, keep it down a bit, I'm live. There you go. Um, you think about it, it's a horrible thought, okay? But the fear that you create watching a horror film is exactly the same as the fear you create when your car skids on ice in winter. Exactly the same as the fear you create on a roller coaster or the fear you create about flying or vomiting or spiders or snakes, okay? None of that fear is any more valid than anything else. Your fear, watching a horror film about a cabin in the woods, that is the same fear you create about vomiting. Okay? They're equally valid, apart from the fact that you're watching a film when it's not real at all. It's on telly. You've created emotion out of nothing by watching a film on telly. And you know that that's a film... And you don't believe the emotions you created. So within five minutes of watching the film, you drop those emotions, get on with the rest of your life. And yet you somehow believe them when they're about vomiting. So I strongly suggest you'll start to question any emotion that you generate about anything. Because they're all generated internally by going by looking through the filters that you apply to a situation. It's not the situation that makes you feel anything at all. The emotions that you create, you are creating off your own back by the way in which you're reacting through the filters and lenses that you have of your belief systems, but it's still you doing it. Life is not making you feel that way. Vomiting is not making you feel that way. You are doing that to yourself. And uh, you need to stop it, really. Hope this helps. Bye.